Okay, so uh, Dr. Licht uh, referred to this seminal paper that came out around 2000 um, describing uh, six essential features of, of cancer cells, despite the fact that cancer is a very diverse disease. Uh, 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 Doug Hanahan and Robert Weinberg uh, noticed that all cancers must show these essential characteristics. And uh, so Sam McBrayer, who is a graduate student in the laboratory of Dr. Steve Rosen and works on altered glucose metabolism and multiple myeloma, is going to expand um, on this uh, theme of the six hallmarks of cancer. And um, I will turn it the podium over to him. All right, thank you very much, Bennett. Um, let me just get this up and going here. Okay. Um, so as Bennett uh, mentioned, my talk will be on the hallmarks of cancer. Uh, and what I really hope to do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so is really give you uh, a broad overview of some of the cellular processes and uh, molecular mechanisms underlying those processes uh, which are intimately associated with the process of tumorigenesis. Um, so first, I just thought I'd acknowledge uh, the people that actually put forth uh, these ideas. Uh, and as Dr. Licht mentioned, uh, both Doug Hanahan, depicted here on the bottom, and Boinberg uh, have made very seminal uh, observations and increased uh, our knowledge of tumor biology greatly, um, and, and therefore uh, are very well uh, qualified to to have published such a, uh, an important review of cancer biology. Um, so first, I'd just like to start by drawing some parallels between the process of tumorigenesis, uh, which is depicted here, uh, versus the process of macroevolution. Um, and these are both processes which rely on the natural selection of heritable genetic traits uh, that serve to increase fitness. Uh, and in the case of a single cell, um, that uh, translates to an increased uh, survival and growth advantage, whereas at the organismal level, uh, this translates to an ability uh, to reproduce um, that's uh, greater than the other individuals within a population. Um, so this all starts at the cellular level uh, with an insult, which can either be endogenous or environmental, uh, and that gives rise to uh, the clonal expansion of a single cell, which is depicted here. Uh, and that uh, is due in large part uh, to that growth advantage conferred by the specific mutation uh, at play. Um, so this progresses over a series of four to seven distinct DNA mutations uh, that derive sequential rounds of clonal, uh, clonal expansion, uh, and eventually these cells are rendered malignant. Uh, and this is when you get the, the appearance of uh, what you would clinically refer to as cancer, or the outgrowth of a, a specific tissue. Um, so this was a very elegant study that was published uh, in PNAS in 2006. Uh, and the authors actually took paired tissues uh, from cancer patients, one from the normal tissue adjacent to a malignancy uh, and the other from the malignancy itself. Uh, and they looked at the fidelity with which the tumor cell or the cells maintained uh, uh, the genetic information coded within this locus. Um, and as you can see here, the normal tissues are, are listed on the left, whereas the neoplastic or cancerous tissues are on the right. Uh, you see magnitudes of order increase in the mutation frequency uh, associated with cancer. Um, and this is really the driving process that gives rise to the six hallmarks of cancer uh, that I'll go into in more detail. Uh, and one interesting thing to note here is actually that uh, the authors also took cultured fibroblasts and treated with a potent known mutagen, ENU. Uh, and even in this extreme example, uh, still some of the tumor samples exhibited a higher rate of mutation frequency, even than throwing a known mutagen directly on cells and culture. Um, so that really highlights how potent of a mechanism that, that this is. Um, so DNA mutations can come in many flavors and are uh, um, uh, induced by a variety of different um, uh, uh, carcinogen exposures, uh, as well as intrinsic factors. Um, and the first class of carcinogen exposures uh, would be due to chemical compounds, um, such as uh, those that are present in cigarette smoke, uh, and also radiation, such as uh, UV that's received through sunlight uh, exposure. 
furthermore, there are uh, intrinsic mechanisms rel which relate to the concept of genomic instability. Uh, and that's what gives rise to these high mutation rates that I uh, displayed on the slide earlier. Um, there are a number of uh, mechanisms at play here, including the corruption of DNA repair mechanisms, um, which are in place uh, to basically fix uh, natural arising uh, mutations within the DNA. Uh, and this is present uh, or exemplified best by uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutations, uh, which are prevalent in breast cancer. Um, also, a failure to detect or respond to DNA damage, uh, such as the example with P53 uh, and uh, the ties that that exhibits with uh, viral infection, um, these are also, uh, you know, commonplace uh, with regards to genomic instability. Um, furthermore, there's more gross alterations, such as those uh, at play uh, during chromosomal maintenance processes, uh, either during mitosis or during natural recombination events, which actually occur in a subset of immune cells. Um, so ir uh, irrespective of which mechanisms at play are at play, um, DNA mutations do arise in cancer, uh, and they can be as simple as a, uh, um, a single nucleotide uh, base substitution and range all the way to um, actual uh, gross uh, changes in uh, chromosome structure. Um, so uh, regardless of the types of mutations uh, that are associated with cancer, uh, the proposal by Hanahan and Weinberg is that all these mutations can be grouped uh, into one of six key hallmarks of cancer. Uh, and these really represent six different capabilities through which all cancer-related alterations can be categorized. Um, so these hallmarks basically all serve to increase the autonomy of the single cell uh, and inhibit subjugation mechanisms uh, that are involved in normal uh, homeostasis within the, the whole organism. So I just want to divide these six hallmarks into two uh, subcategories, um, the first of which is those that are re uh, related to growth promotion or the outgrowth of malignant cells. Uh, and the accumulation of malignant cells within the body is regulated by two distinct processes. Uh, one, through the, the attrition or death of these cells, which is depicted here, uh, and cells have uh, evolved means to evade apoptosis or the programmed cell death that occurs, uh, particularly in the context of uh, oncogenic stress. Um, furthermore, the accumulation of cells is obviously uh, also regulated by the rate of proliferation of the tumor cells. Uh, and three of the hallmarks really deal with this process, uh, an insensitivity to anti-growth signals, a self-sufficiency in growth signals, uh, and also the ability to uh, replicate limitlessly. Um, so the first hallmark I'll dive into is uh, a self-sufficiency in growth signals. And, and this deals with uh, the decision that every cell must make uh, within the cell cycle uh, as to whether or not it's going to proceed and replicate the chromosomes and, and undergo mitosis, or whether it's going to stay in an arrested state. Um, and the body has uh, very finely tuned mechanisms to deal with this issue, uh, and it's dependent on cell-cell interactions. Therefore, no single cell within the body has the intrinsic ability to decide whether or not it uh, divides. And this protects the whole organism and puts the needs of the whole organism ahead of those of any single cell within the body. Uh, and in this case, uh, soluble growth factors released into the extracellular milieu uh, are the most common in transducing these signals. Um, so a common process in cancer is actually onco oncogene activation, which can mimic uh, these normal signaling processes between two neighboring cells. Uh, and this results in aberrant cell growth. Um, so there are a variety of mechanisms that uh, can be at, at play here, and these are uh, really specific for different types of cancers. Um, and I've kind of grouped them into six broad categories here. Um, one is the aberrant uh, activation of growth factor receptors in the absence of that uh, critical stimulus, uh, and that's depicted uh, at this stage within uh, this diagram. And that can occur due to overexpression or mutation of the protein itself. Uh, and this results in um, a hierarchical activation of downstream signaling pathways, uh, two of which are, are the RAS and PI3 kinase pathways, which are uh, highly relevant to tumor biology. Um, which actually leads me to the next mechanism that I'd like to highlight. Uh, there are frequent mutations in the RAS protein, uh, as well as P PI3 kinase, uh, which can transduce signals that actually don't exist uh, emanating from the plasma membrane. 
Um, Dr. Lick mentioned autocrine growth factor signaling, which is interesting, uh, where a cell actually produces the, the growth factors it needs to decide to proliferate. Uh, or a tumor cell can uh, elicit paracrine growth factor signaling or induce a neighboring cell uh, to release those growth factors that they express receptors for. Um, furthermore, uh, there's aberrant expression of nuclear receptors. Uh, and a great example of this is uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, uh, where normal mammary cells do not ex uh, express this receptor, uh, and therefore these cells become responsive to estrogen stimulation. Um, and, and decide to proliferate uh, in an abnormal sense. Um, furthermore, there are a class of proteins uh, here exemplified by integrins and cadherins, uh, which have dual adhesion and signaling roles uh, and result in uh, the anchoring of these cells either to proteins within the extracellular matrix or to neighboring cells, uh, but also harbor um, signaling roles and can induce growth this way. Um, so these are just two examples of uh, the um, highly robust expression of some of these uh, mechanisms in tumors. Uh, and these are both uh, examples of immunohistochemistry, uh, which basically uh, relies on taking slices from an excised tumor and incubating uh, with a chromogen-labeled uh, antibody. So you can specifically detect proteins, and in the case of phospho-AKT, uh, an activated form of the protein uh, within these tissues. Um, and as you can see here, uh, brown depicts a high level of expression. Uh, and if you compare this tumor node with the surrounding normal tissue, uh, you really see how robust of a mechanism this can be. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, many of these uh, growth factor receptors signal through the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. Uh, and when you stain cells from breast uh, cancer tissue, uh, with uh, an antibody recognizing activated AKT, uh, you see how these signals are related. Um, in specific tumors. Um, so the flip side of the coin to uh, self-sufficiency in growth signals would be an insensitivity to anti-growth signals. Uh, and um, in normal tissues, obviously in a, a fully differentiated, um, uh, you know, fully grown human adult, uh, you don't want your liver to continue growing, right? There's got to be me mechanisms to suppress the outgrowth of normal cells. Um, however, there are certain uh, phases, such as tissue injury, when you want to stimulate proliferation. Um, so under basal uh, conditions in most tissues, uh, there's a process of quiescence, which is a, a reversible exit from the cell cycle. Uh, and this decision actually occurs in G1 phase of the cell cycle, um, before the cell reaches the restriction point, where it decides whether or not to proceed to S phase, replicate DNA, and eventually undergo mitosis. Um, Another uh, less prevalent mechanism also exists, which is a permanent relinquishment of replicative capacity. Uh, and an interesting example of this is what happens in red blood cells or erythrocytes. Um, so in immature red blood cells called erythroblasts, uh, upon differentiation to a, a fully differentiated red blood cell, uh, these cells actually extrude their nucleus and all the genetic information encoded within it um, so that they physically lack the capability to proliferate uh, beyond that certain stage. Um, so it's not surprising that tumors have evolved complex mechanisms to circumvent both of these processes. Um, and there are two main types of anti-growth signals that uh, tumors have become refractory to. Uh, one is the release of soluble growth inhibitors, which are uh, analogous to growth factors. Uh, and also there's inhibitors uh, which are immobilized in the extracellular matrix or displayed on normal, uh, normal neighboring cells. Uh, and these uh, usually induce a quiescent phenotype. Um, most of these anti-growth signals are integrated through uh, the RB1 gene, which produces a, a protein known as retinoblastoma due to its uh, intimate association with the development uh, of a child in malignancy, also referred to as retinoblastoma. And you can see one of these tumors clearly here, which develops within the eye. Um, and you see two key points here in the cell cycle where RB uh, regulation becomes very important. One is that that restriction site that I mentioned on uh, the slide before, uh, where RB becomes phosphorylated and inactivated, uh, and thus allows cell cycle progression. And after the cell is divided, uh, this protein becomes dephosphorylated and reactivated to inhibit any further uh, rounds of division. Um, what happens in this specific malignancy is actually a truncation event, such that the part of the protein that interacts with 
um, a variety of other intercellular proteins uh, becomes missing and RB becomes functionally inactivated. Um, so I'd also like to highlight a few therapeutic applications um, that are associated with each of the hallmarks of cancer. Um, and hopefully that'll give you a little bit more practical understanding of how these have been implemented clinically. Um, so uh, this is the picture of the DNA replication machinery. Um, and one uh, critical enzyme component is uh, a topoisomerase uh, protein. And this actually precedes the polymerase uh, protein and uh, is responsible for unwinding DNA and allowing access to the genetic information contained within it. Um, and so one of the most classical uh, classes of uh, chemotherapeutics are topoisomerase 1 and 2 inhibitors, uh, which inhibit uh, DNA replication and induce DNA double strand breaks uh, due to this incomplete replication of chromosomes. Uh, and these have been very potent, uh, you know, mainstay sorts of chemotherapies, um, but also result in significant side effects. Um, uh, so the next hallmark that I'd like to touch upon is uh, the ability of tumor cells to grow continuously uh, and without uh, any sorts of uh, limitations in that respect. Um, and as Dr. Licht mentioned, it, uh, this process is dependent on the maintaining uh, healthy chromosomes or uh, essentially a buffer zone at the end of chromosomes uh, which allows cells to protect genetic information uh, at the end of chromosomes. Um, I'd just I'd like to highlight this graph here, which looks at uh, mean telomere length on the y-axis uh, versus the number of cell doublings on the x-axis, and point out that most normal tissues that undergo quiescence uh, never reach either of the critical phases that are encountered by tumor cells, uh, the first of which is senescence, or a permanent inhibition of cell cycle progression, uh, and the second is crisis, which results in uh, overt death. Um, so these actually drive mutations at, at both different points uh, along the doubling lifetime of tumor cells. Uh, and these uh, mutations actually serve to increase telomere length ultimately uh, and protect that genetic information uh, against degradation. Um, so this is just the structure of a telomere. Uh, and actually the telomere is made up of a six DNA base repeat repeated thousands of times. Uh, and it consists of the bases TTAGGG. Um, and this actually serves as a docking sequence for a variety of different proteins within the cell. Uh, and these proteins form a loop at the end of chromosomes which protects that DNA uh, and actually um, prevents uh, recognition by DNA repair pathways, uh, which normally recognize DNA double-stranded breaks as being uh, problematic. Uh, and so actually, um, there's an interesting mechanism for cancer cells to evade this uh, mechanism of regulation, uh, and that is through the overexpression of telomerase, which is an enzyme that specifically uh, catalyzes the polymerization of, new D, uh, polymerization of new DNA sequences at the end of chromosomes. Uh, in this protein, uh, the expression is potently repressed in almost all normal tissues before birth as a tumor suppressive mechanism. Uh, and in stem cells, which are responsible for uh, tissue regeneration, uh, the expression of telomerase is tightly regulated. Uh, and this makes sense when you see uh, the tight association with cancers. Um, it's estimated that 80, 90, 80 to 90% of solid tumors uh, overexpress telomerase. Um, and this aberrant expression results in uh, uh, the cancer being able to circumvent telomere length dependent growth arrest and ultimately cell death. Um, so as for a therapeutic application, I, you know, I thought about talking about telomerase inhibitors, but that's not very exciting. So I thought I'd talk about a little bit sexier approach. Uh, and this is outlined in a, a PNAS paper two years ago. Uh, and this consists of telomerase-guided surgical tumor resection. Um, and the specificity of expression in telomerase uh, with cancer um, can actually be uh, capitalized upon in this model. Um, to, got, to help uh, surgical oncologists uh, successfully resect and cut out a tumor. Um, so this is a, a mice that uh, has been xenografted with a highly invasive uh, disseminated form of colon cancer, uh, and upon which uh, this mice is actually injected with an adenovirus whose expression of key viral genes is driven off a telomerase promoter. Um, so you should only get efficient adenovirus replication in cells uh, which express active telomerase. Um, so actually this results in GFP labeling 
since the GFP gene is included in this adenoviral cassette. Uh, and you get specific labeling of tumor tissue, uh, which enables a, a more complete uh, excision, especially with nodes that are widely disseminated throughout the mouse. Um, it remains to be seen if anybody is willing to, to undergo such a procedure, but uh, you know, with the types of tumors that this would be applied to, uh, it may be an only option. So I thought that was an interesting example of um, how to capitalize on that specificity. Um, so the next and final growth promoting capability that I'd like to talk about is uh, the evasion of apoptosis. Uh, and apoptosis is uh, programmed cell death, which is an energy independent uh, or energy dependent process uh, that the cell actively decides to undergo. Um, and there's a, a whole, um, a vast array of proteins that are involved within uh, the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis, which is depicted here. Um, and this integrates numerous different signals, such as those derived from chemotherapy treatment, uh, irradiation, or growth factor withdrawal. And a variety of pro-apoptotic proteins are activated uh, in response to these stimuli, which translocate to the mitochondria and actually induce the association of two key proteins called BACs and BAC. And what these proteins actually do is punch a hole in the wall of the mitochondria, uh, allowing the escape of uh, cytochrome C, which subsequently activates caspases, which are proteases within the cell, uh, basically responsible for massive protein degradation. Um, ultimately, at the end of this process, DNA is degraded as well, so there's no potential for these cells to survive. Um, and I should mention that there are numerous functions in normal physiology for this pathway. Um, one being tissue remodeling, for example, the digitation of our hands during birth. Uh, massive apoptosis occurs between the digits, uh, enables you not to have paws or something like that. Um, uh, also, the elimination of damaged cells uh, in response to the activation of this pathway is a tumor suppressive mechanism. Um, so I know this is a fairly similar video to the one that Dr. Licht showed. Um, so what you can see here, these are uh, porcine cells that are treated with a topocyte, actually, um, which is the topoisomerase inhibitor that I was referring to previously. Uh, and actually, these cells have been labeled with a DNA stain um, that in this context appears yellow, so you can visualize the dynamic changes that, are undergo uh, that the nucleus is undergoing. Um, and what you'll notice here is uh, this membrane blebbing and the release of um, specific vesicles containing degraded cellular components uh, within the uh, basically into the extracellular environment. Um, so yeah, I thought that was just a nice uh, representation of that process. So there are a variety of uh, mechanisms by which tumor cells uh, evade apoptosis. Um, and this basically uh, relies on usurping this balance between pro-death and pro-survival proteins, which ultimately control cell fate. Um, there's a specific uh, family member of proteins called the BCL2 family members, uh, which directly inhibit BAC's BAC association and thus the permeabilization of the mitochondria. Um, I pulled an example from uh, a cancer that I work on, uh, which is multiple myeloma, where the uh, expression of MCL1, uh, which is a BCL2 family member, actually increases over time uh, in many of these cancer patients. Um, and if you stratify these cancer patients according to their expression of MCL1, uh, you see a huge impact on the event-free survival. Um, which basically contains uh, figures related to uh, overall death and um, time to progression of the tumor. Um, and, and these are capable of acting in an upstream fashion. Uh, conversely, there's an IAP family uh, of proteins, uh, which stands for inhibitors of apoptosis, which can directly bind and inhibit caspases, uh, which plays a role uh, in, in latter, process, uh, latter steps in the apoptotic cascade. Um, and uh, what's considered a significant advance recently is the development of this compound right here uh, by Abbott Laboratories uh, called ABT737. Uh, and this actually directly binds a subset of BCL2 family members, uh, and this inhibits the sequestration of BACs and BAC uh, and allows the, mitochondrial to become per uh, the mitochondria to become permeabilized. I thought this was an interesting example of the efficacy of this compound. Uh, this is... Um, representative of a, a prostate cancer mouse model, uh, which is refractory to cisplatin. You see no effect of cisplatin, a, a classic DNA damaging agent in these uh, tumors. However, uh, ABT uh, is highly effective and maintains uh, uh, 
uh, tumor growth inhibition even after the end of treatment, which is signified by this black bar here. Um, so uh, this has many people in the field very excited, and hopefully it will be a nice uh, complement um, to a variety of the chemotherapies that we have available right now. Um, so the final two capabilities that I'd like to touch on uh, don't involve cell growth directly, but uh, actually involve capabilities regarding the microenvironment in which tumor cells uh, grow. Um, and the first uh, is sustained angiogenesis, or the process of new blood vessel formation. Um, and it turns out that in uh, normal tissues, there's a, a requirement that cells reside within a specific proximity to a nearest capillary. And this has been, de been determined to be between 100 and 150 microns. Um, and as you can imagine, as the tumor expands without any significant angiogenesis occurring, um, the tumor will eventually outstrip its blood supply, and this will become a growth limiting mechanism. Um, and this is uh, related to the diffusion limitation of oxygen. Uh, as you see in this figure over here, um, cells which are uh, the furthest from a blood vessel actually find themselves in an anoxic environment or that without oxygen, uh, and you see uh, an alternative form of cell death, necrosis, occurring in these areas of the tumor. Um, this is also, uh, the blood supply is also uh, required for nutrient supply, such as glucose and amino acids, uh, as well as the removal of waste, which can be quite significant in some cancers. Um, so hypoxia is actually a driving force um, to elicit this angiogenic response. Uh, and this is, um, these signals uh, of decreased oxygen are integrated through hypoxia-inducible factors, which are proteins that are directly stabilized by hypoxia. Um, and, and the result is uh, either with HIF stabilization or in the case of some uh, oncogene activation, uh, you increase the secretion of vac vascular endothelial growth factor expression, uh, which then translocates to the nearest endothelial cell within the vasculature uh, and stimulates the process of angiogenesis and uh, restores blood supply to the affected tissue. Um, one thing that I'd like to note is that this does occur in a pathological manner in tumor growth, uh, wherein the tumor cells actually don't uh, cease to produce VEGF uh, upon gaining that blood supply. And this actually results in the malformation uh, of blood vessels, and some have hypothesized that this is actually involved in uh, malignant progression. Um, so these are some beautiful images that uh, were displayed in a, a recent Nature Medicine paper uh, where the authors applied um, a new angiography technique, um, or basically um, a technique of visualizing uh, blood vessels. Um, and the yellow is represented by blood vessels which are closer to the surface, uh, whereas red are deeper within the tumor. And what I'd like to point out here is this massive chaotic network of malformed blood vessels that you see around this tumor here. Um, and upon treatment with a monoclonal antibody that recognizes the VEGF receptor, uh, you see a really uh, nice resolving effect and an inhibition of angiogenesis uh, in this mouse model of cancer. Um, so many tumors have actually displayed disappointing clinical results thus far. Um, uh, you know, Dr. Lick mentioned one uh, apparent home run in colon cancer, um, but many other solid tumors don't respond to this type of therapy, and it's unclear at this point why. Um, but one explanation is that hypoxia may actually um, be tumor promoting in some instances by increasing genetic instability um, and switching these cells to growth supporting metabolic adaptations. Uh, so finally, the, the last hallmark that I'd like to touch upon here um, is tissue invasion and metastasis. Um, and invasion is the tumor cell movement across boundaries which define normal tissue architecture and results in the infiltration of tumor cells outside of the site uh, of the primary tumor. Um, whereas metastasis is a really broad term to describe uh, the entire process of colonization of distal organs by tumor cells. Uh, and this is important to understand in uh, uh, relation to cancer biology is this actually causes 90% of human cancer deaths. Um, so this schematic uh, just depicts some of the primary steps within this process. Um, first, cells uh, either in a group or singly uh, detach from a primary tumor and invade surrounding tissue, uh, upon which point they can intravasate or enter the bloodstream uh, and become transported to another site within the body. Um, at this point, cells bind to the inside of the blood vessel wall uh, and actually exit through a process known as extravasation, 
Uh, and at this point, they can colonize and um, form uh, what are called micrometastases uh, in these distal organs, such as the lung, uh, the liver, uh, lymph nodes are a common place, as well as bone marrow. Um, so I included this uh, video, which is really rec it, uh, represents a, a neat technological advance in how we can image tumor behavior. Um, and this was actually presented by uh, a guest speaker here at Northwestern uh, a number of months ago. Um, so this is taken uh, from a paper in which uh, they're studying a mouse model of uh, breast cancer, and the tumor cells appear labeled in, uh, uh, by GFP. And what you'll see here is actually a lot of movement of cells throughout the tumor around the periphery here. However, there's one specific cell which you'll actually see migrate down this way and then accelerate extremely rapidly, which is indicative of the cell actually entering the bloodstream. Uh, and it's one of our first looks at this uh, complex process that occurs here. Um, what you would see, like I said, is a, a rapid acceleration that basically um, cannot be uh, associated with cell movement itself, must be associated with the entry of the cell into the bloodstream. Um, so there are uh, faculty members actually here at Northwestern that are taking aim at this process. Um, and one of uh, these faculty members is Ray Bergen on the Chicago campus. Uh, and he's been particularly interested in genistein, which is a natural product derived from soy. Uh, and this inhibits metastasis in mice, as he shows in a recent cancer research paper. Um, here, uh, this is a prostate cancer mouse model, uh, and you see uh, no effect of uh, an increased dose of genistein on tumor volume, uh, but you see a marked and dose-dependent decrease in uh, the frequency of metastasis to the lung in this model. Um, so these could be a, a very important addition to our uh, chemotherapeutic arsenal at this point. Um, and so finally, in conclusion, I'd just like to highlight that uh, the accumulation in uh, diverse orders and combinations of these uh, uh, molecular events that give rise to hallmarks of cancer uh, are really what underlies the heterogeneity uh, in looking at, uh, you know, different types of tumors as well as tumors within the same type. Um, and really gaining a, a critical understanding of the molecular mechanisms present in each individual tumor um, should hopefully enable a more personalized approach to uh, cancer therapy. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. A question um, about how metastasize forms. So is there anything like a minimum number of cells required? So. You know, actually, that's kind of a, a point of contention among biologists at this point, um, because different mouse models of cancer will show different things. Uh, where in some models you see, like, um, uh, basically a, a chunk of tumor, a group of cells which are uh, attached via intercellular junctions, um, break off and move as a, a clump together. Um, whereas in other models, um, you see the dissemination of uh, single cells uh, into the normal tissue. Um, so that's uh, really a point which needs a lot of further work uh, to be done. But you know, with the advances made in um, being able to visualize these changes in mouse models, uh, that should be a question that we can address relatively quickly. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, then I'll hand it over to the uh, or to Bennett here for the next speaker. <laughs>